Hello, everyone. My name is Rose Gottemuller, and I am your host today at this virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm a distinguished lecturer at the Freeman Spoley Institute for International Studies at Stanford University, former Deputy Secretary General of NATO, and your moderator for this afternoon's program with Secretary William Perry and Tom Kalina. This program is part of the Commonwealth Club's virtual series. We'd like to thank our members, donors, and supporters for making this and all of our other programs possible. We are grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. If you're watching along with us and have a question, please put it in the text chat on YouTube and I'll work in as many questions as possible. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our guests. Dr. William Perry is the former Secretary of Defense under President Clinton and founder of the William J. Perry Project, a nonprofit organization which works to educate the public on the dangers of nuclear weapons. Tom Kalina is the Director of Policy and at the Plowshares Fund and previously served as the Research Director for the Arms Control Association. He has spent over 30 years in the field of nuclear weapons, missile defense, and nonproliferation issues. Together, Dr. Perry and Mr. Kalina are co-authors of the new book, The Button, The New Nuclear Arms Race and Presidential Power from Truman to Trump. The book investigates why nearly every governmental process is subject to institutional checks and balances, yet the deployment of nuclear weapons is not. Throughout the book, our guests discuss the many glitches and slip-ups that have nearly resulted in nuclear winter, from misinformation to hacking to presidential indisposition and illness. As we approach the 75th anniversaries of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it is particularly important that we reflect on the terrifying history of nuclear launch authority and discuss how to balance issues of national security with global stability. Our guests will initially talk for a few minutes and then we'll have a conversation to round out the hour. I'm now very pleased to welcome Secretary William Perry and Tom Kalina. Gentlemen, over to you. Rose, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. So bear with me for a second. We hope this will work. All right, uh, I think our screen is being shared, excellent. Uh, so again, I'm Tom Colina, Policy Director at the Plowshares Fund, and I had the honor of writing this book with Bill Perry, which was just published in June. And the reason we chose this timing is because, of course, we've just had the 75th anniversary of the first nuclear test, the Trinity test, earlier this month. Next month will mark the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. And of course, this November, we will choose our next president. Uh, and to us, these events create an historic opportunity to debate the future of U.S. nuclear policy uh, and that we have now lived with a bomb for 75 years. So now is the time to ask, uh, what should the next president do to reduce the risk of nuclear war? But first, some context. Um, the national crisis that we're all experiencing, uh, the battered economy, the resurgent coronavirus, racial injustice, all of this creates important opportunities for change. Um, and as the coronavirus shows, US leaders have been focused on the wrong threats. We're spending way too much on outdated threats, uh, Cold War threats and scenarios, and not enough on the real threats that we face today. For example, despite spending $700 billion on defense each year, many Americans simply do not feel safe. Uh, take, for example, the trillion dollars that the United States is planning to spend on nuclear weapons over the next few decades. Much of this is simply not needed, and we should see this as a nuclear piggy bank that the next president can break open to pay for high, higher priority needs. But this is not just about money. Uh, we need to change policy, too. The bomb does simply not address the most serious <laughs> threats we face, and in fact, it can make those threats even worse. So let's unpack this a bit. We like to start with this photo because it tends to focus the mind. Uh, here's President Trump with the infamous football, the briefcase that contains everything the president needs to start nuclear war. This is literally how close we are to nuclear war every day, every minute, right now. 
and President Trump can order a nuclear attack on his own authority uh, with no second opinions, uh, no input from Congress or the Secretary of Defense is required. Now, we don't mean to single out President Trump in this regard. Uh, of course, his impulsive nature and disregard for the facts highlight these concerns, but all presidents make mistakes. They're all human. Uh, and therefore, that, un that underlines our argument that no single human should control the future of humanity. Yet we, the American people, choose to give presidents this absolute power. Why? Why do we choose to live so close to the brink of disaster? Well, uh, we think, and we found through the book, that it's because U.S. nuclear policy is focused on the wrong threat. So in the book, we make this central argument. That U.S. policy is focused on the wrong threat of a surprise attack from Russia. Such an attack is highly unlikely, we argue, for the simple reason that it would mean utter destruction for both sides. And yet U.S. nuclear policy has been based on this threat <clears throat> for decades. And so here's the big problem, is that this mistaken threat assessment increases the risk of blundering into nuclear war by mistake. We could start a nuclear war in response to a false alarm, one of the greatest dangers in the world, and we simply don't need to take this risk. Instead, we must move away from quick launch policies and give the president more decision time. Bill, turning to you, you had a front row seat in the arms race and met with Soviet and Russian officials many times. Uh, some might challenge our central assertion that a surprise attack from Russia is not a likely threat. What would you say to that? <clears throat> Well, I say I met, when I was Secretary of Defense, I met with all of the Russian leaders from the president on down, and hundreds, if not thousands, of Russians. <clears throat> One thing I can say with much confidence, the Russians are not stupid. The Russians are not suicidal. Therefore, we have been focusing on the wrong threat. But there is a real threat, a real danger, and that's a danger that we will blunder, we will blunder into a nuclear war. So let us, sorry, technical difficulties here. I <laughs> try to advance this slide. There we go. Of course, I went too far. <clears throat> the perceived threat of a surprise attack drives the military requirement <clears throat> that we must be ready to launch nuclear weapons at all times within minutes. Uh, and that, in turn, drives these three dangerous policies, that the president has sole authority to launch nuclear weapons within minutes, with no second opinions <clears throat> over that the president can order a first strike and is not limited to retaliation, and that the president can launch hundreds of land-based ballistic missiles, ICBMs, on warning of attack without waiting for proof of attack. And we go through in the book uh, the dangers of these policies. But please, Bill, give us your sense of why this combination of policies <clears throat> is so dangerous. <clears throat> we have a warning system that we're under attack, which is a, a technical marvel. It can, it's designed to and does detect a Russian missile or a missile anywhere in the world, actually, within minutes after a few minutes after it's being launched track its trajectory and determine whether it's going to strike the United States. As I said, this is a technical marvel, but it is a technical system and is run by people and machines do error and people do error. And so we have had false alarms, not many, just a few, but it only takes one. In the United States alone, we've had three false alarms that I'm personally aware of. One of them, occurred during the Cold War when I was the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. I will never forget that false alarm. I was in bed, sound asleep, when I got a telephone call at about three o'clock in the morning. As I picked up the phone, the voice on the other end identified himself as the watch officer on the North American Air Defense Command. 
the general got right to the point. The first thing he said was his computers were showing 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. I will never forget that moment. Happily, he quickly added, he had determined that this was a false alarm, that his computers were somehow in error. He was calling me to see if I could help him determine what had gone wrong with his computers. The sequel to that story is that it took us really a couple of days to determine what had gone wrong with his computer. And what happened in that case was there's a very simple microchip in the computer which had malfunctioned, a technical error. One of the other false alarms we had that I'm familiar with was a result of human error. In that case, the operator, new operator coming on watch that night, meant to put the end of the computer, the operating tape for the computer, and instead he mistakenly put in a training tape. So what was shown on the computer was a very realistic simulation of an attack underway. Well, we caught both of those mistakes. And the first one, the one I described to you though, it was a close call. Because before the watch officer called me, before he knew it was a false alarm, he called the White House. This was three o'clock in the morning. A national security advisor took the call. That was the big Brzezinski. And he believed it was a real attack and prepared himself accordingly. But before he called the president and woke him up, he got another call just two minutes later telling him that the, the general had determined it was a false alarm. Had that second call not come through, Brzezinski would have woken the president. The president would then have had uh, five or six minutes to decide whether to launch our ICBMs before they were destroyed in their silos. He had to make that decision. He would have had to make that decision just after getting out of bed. No one to consult with in this case except Brzezinski. And really no basis for making a, an informed judgment. That's the way our system works. Now this marvelous alert system I talked to you about, it is a marvel, it's a technological marvel, and it rarely er makes mistakes. Only three mistakes in decades, many decades, that's the good news. The bad news is that it only takes one, and it only takes one, to bring about the end of our civilization. Tom, back to you. Thank you, Bill. And again, trying to move this, <laughs> move to the next slide, there we go. So the next US president uh, can and must reorient our nuclear policy away from a Russian surprise attack to preventing accidental war. Um, and Bill, please lay out our main arguments for how to do this. First of all, we should end sole authority. Our founders, hundreds of years ago, determined that the United States could only declare war, only take that fatal action without the decision of Congress. They never wanted to give it to one person, one person to make this decision. They gave it to Congress for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons was precisely they caused it to no one quick action. They wanted deliberation, consultation. But now that's a, it has all been bypassed with the sole authority that the president has. So we want to end sole authority. Secondly, we would like the new president, when he comes in, to establish a no first use policy for the United States, a policy that we will not be the first to use nuclear weapons. We will use nuclear weapons only for deterrence and only if we are already under attack and our missiles have already struck our country. And third, I believe we ought to phase out our land-based ICBMs, our land-based missiles. They are 
the danger of a false alarm hinges primarily on the quick decision that has to be made. And ICBMs are by their nature to be used quickly. They are designed to be used quickly. They can be launched a few minutes after the alert is given. They've done that so they can get out of their silos before they're destroying their silos and attack. Happily, our deterrence does not depend on our ICBMs. We also have sea launch missiles, which are at sea and not detectable. And we have bombers, which can be launched in an emergency. So we want to phase out our land ice. Um, land-based ICMs, they are, in my judgment, an accident waiting to happen. Tom. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and we're going to wrap up this presentation so we can get to your questions. Uh, but just to end up by saying that nuclear weapons really are the president's weapons. And every four years, we have a chance to change U.S. nuclear policy. And the 75th anniversary of the bomb <clears throat> and the current national crisis should inspire us to rethink our approach to national security. U.S. nuclear policy simply is doing us more harm than good, and it magnifies the dangers we face from the most likely nuclear threat, which to us is blundering into nuclear war by mistake. And the next president can and must fix this. Uh, we know this will be hard. We're up against 75 years of outdated thinking and a $50 billion industry, and history tells us that major change like this is only possible if led uh, from the president uh, at the top with public pressure to deliver. So we're looking to educate uh, the next president and the public like you. Um, thank you very much for your time and attention. If you're interested in buying the book, please go to benbellabooks.com and use the code button 30 for 30% off. And please, if you like the book, uh, rate us on Amazon. And uh, hopefully Rose will join us now as I stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Hello, miraculously I am here. And uh, thank you both for an excellent, excellent presentation. I'll just uh, remind our viewers to uh, put your questions into YouTube chat. I already have a few. And so I'll start in right away. Uh, the name of your book, The Button, conjures up memories of President Trump's challenge to the North Korean leader, I have the biggest button. It certainly is a vivid memory from the Cold War, and uh, certainly recollections of the Cuban Missile Crisis might be in there too, but let's stay with North Korea. What concerns do you both have about North Korea, and should uh, the president meet with Kim Jong-un again? Uh, over to you, Bill. Perhaps your comment on that? Well, I er, early in my career, I actually spent quite a bit of time negotiating with North Korea. The objective of those negotiations was to get them to not start a nuclear program, not build a nuclear arsenal. Uh, we were very close, actually, to an agreement. Uh, but that agreement never was reached because before we actually got to signing the agreement, there was a change of administration and the new administration decided they had a better way of solving the nuclear problem in North Korea. That better way, I might add parenthetically, ended up with North Korea with a nuclear arsenal today. But so one, one thing I learned in talking with the North Koreans, and I have a good many discussions with North Koreans at all levels, political and military levels, is that they're not stupid and they're not suicidal either. Uh, they are building, they are determined to have their nuclear weapons and now, now indeed they have them. But they had them because they feared that the United States was out to overthrow their regime, which was not an unfounded fear, I might say. And they, they believed that these nuclear weapons would deter us from taking military actions which could overthrow their regime. So in other words, they had them for deterrence reasons. We should be able to understand that. That's why we have our nuclear weapons. With that in mind, I say I'm not happy about the nuclear arsenal. I wish we had been successful in keeping them from getting them. But they do have it, and I am not concerned they're going to make a suicidal attack. So we now have to live in a state of deterrence with North Korea. In the meantime, we should continue our negotiations to see if we can now get them to give up the nuclear arsenal. But I must point out, 
it's much more difficult. Whoever negotiates with them now has a more difficult problem than I had. All I had to do was persuade them not to build a nuclear arsenal. Whoever negotiates with them now has to persuade them to give up an arsenal they already have and they like it very much. Thank you. So, yes, we should keep up the negotiations. I don't have high hopes that they will be successful. Certainly, the approach was taken by President Trump showed no sign of success at all. Um, I fear because he didn't understand the basic reason that the North Koreans had their nuclear weapons and wasn't prepared then to, to negotiate with them in a way that was ease their concerns about our overthrowing the regime so that they would not feel so press, pressed to have nuclear weapons. So I, that's the short answer on the North Korea, Rose. If you don't have anything to add, Tom, I'll jump on to the next question. Sure, go ahead. And that is, uh, Bill, you about uh, about getting rid of the ICBMs, uh, that is the land-based uh, missiles in our triad. Uh, is it necessary to convince everybody else to get rid of their land-based ICBMs, their land-based missiles? Let me say, first of all, I don't think we would be successful if we tried. The Russians, the ICBMs are the Russians' main uh, deterrent for us. We have a far superior force at sea in our, in our nuclear submarines than they do. So they would consider it a big disadvantage if they gave up the ICBMs. So I know I don't think they will give it up. We should give them up, not as a favor to the Russians, uh, not because we expect the Russians to reciprocate it. We should give it up because it will improve our security if we give them up. We can still maintain ter- deterrence with our nuclear sub- <coughs> submarines and our bombers. And if necessary, we can put our bombers on alert. Uh, if we think that's a, if they think that's a requirement, so we can maintain security without them, and the problem with them is they have this very very real risk of a false alarm. As I've told you, uh, a nuclear false alarm is not, in my mind, a theoretical possibility. Having lived through one firsthand, I see it as a very real danger, and the danger which could very well lead to the end of our civilization. Rose, if I could, I could just add yes, that please, Tom. now is the time for us to debate the future of the land-based ballistic missiles, because we're on the verge of uh, starting a process to spend about $100 billion to rebuild them all. Um, so not only are they dangerous, not only do we not need them for deterrence, but they're tremendously expensive. Um, so we can save a lot of money to redirect to other higher priority needs um, by having that conversation now. Okay, Tom, I just want to make sure we've got the zeros right. Did you say 100 billion or 100 million? 100 billion. All right. All right, that got a little muffled, but I thought it was 100 billion. I'm sorry. Let's stick, let's stick with you for a minute, Tom. Uh, what is, uh, and one of our viewers wants to know, what is the actual process that you are recommending to require another person or persons in the decision to push the button? Uh, are you uh, trying to get Congress involved? Say a bit more about what you're proposing in that regard. Sure, great question. Um, We think the president, the executive should share that authority with Congress. Um, So one proposal is actually there's legislation for this proposed by Senator Markey and Congressman Liu uh, that would require congressional approval before nuclear weapons could be used first. So that would be sharing authority uh, with Congress. There are different proposals about how much of Congress you'd wanna share that with. Uh, all of Congress, a subset of Congress, but usually those concerns uh, are focused on a misperception. And that misperception is that there's some need to launch quickly. Um, and, and we say, state in the book, that that's simply not the case. If nuclear weapons were headed over here, and a very unlikely scenario, uh, there's no need for the president to respond quickly. Uh, in fact, you know, if, those, if it is an actual attack, those weapons will land, regardless of whether the president launches quickly or not. So we think uh, the president should take the time to make uh, a thoughtful decision, and there's simply no need to rush into something that could be blundering into nuclear Mm. war by mistake. Rose, I'd like to make a parenthetical comment here. Sure. Tom referred to Congressman Liu, who, by the way, has been an earlier speaker at the Commonwealth Club here in San Francisco. But what comment I want to make about him, he was a student of mine several decades ago, a student that I'm very, very proud of. It makes me, made me believe sometimes that it was worth standing up to class and, and giving lectures. And somebody, uh, somebody out there is listening. 
Thank you. Very, very good. Well, let's stay on some of the modern weapons that are emerging. Since we're talking about uh, you know time to target, speed to target, uh, one questioner asked, do hypersonics increase the danger of nuclear war? I want to say that hypersonic glide vehicles are under development now, and in Russia's case, they're already beginning to Bentley, uh, but also China, the U.S., and France are developing hypersonic glide uh, vehicles uh, as delivery vehicles for both conventional and nuclear uh, warheads. So what do you both think? Do hypersonics increase the danger of nuclear war? I think my comment about hypersonic missiles is that Russia is developing them, and we are beginning to develop them also because they will penetrate enemy defenses. Russia had made a big point of bragging about, in fact, the president in the State of Federation speech bragged that he was developing these modern, miraculous new missiles, which would be able to defeat America's defense. That's really a say, statement that's stupid on his face because they already have ICBMs which, which can penetrate our defense. The hypersonics add nothing, add nothing to their threat to us. And our IC, hypersonic missiles we build them will add nothing to the Russian threat. So they're, uh, they're, they have solved a problem which doesn't exist. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, Tom, I have a question here that uh, actually is interesting to me as well. When you were working on the book, did you look into the security procedures uh, that uh, the Russians have with regard to their ICBMs and their launch procedures and, and how to prevent accidental launch? Uh, is that something that you, uh, you took a look at? That was not the focus of the book, but uh, I'll note that recently Russia came out with a new policy where it becomes clear that they are mirroring the U.S. policy and that it's up to the president of Russia to launch nuclear weapons uh, as it is here in the United States. And I would just point out that that's tremendously dangerous there as well, uh, because it's our impression that, that a Russian president would have even, even less time to determine whether uh, an alarm would be real or false. Uh, and, and so if, if the Russians blunder into nuclear war, guess where those weapons would be aimed? Probably here at the United States. So it's in our interest to solve this problem in Russia as well as here. And there are things we can do, for example, uh, a no first use policy or trying to share uh, launch authority uh, with more decision makers that would benefit our security and Russian security as well. Very good, thank you. Uh, Dr. Perry, I have a question that's uh, suitable for a former Secretary of Defense, and that is, um, how will the rise of China as a superpower impact American defense policy? How do you see it? I'm, I'm very concerned about China as, as a uh, defense issue. The issue with China, I think, evolves around the South China Sea. China regards as China Sea as more or less an inland lake. Uh, we regard it, of course, as international waters. And we want, we want to make our point by having our warships steam through those waters frequently. And the Chinese want to make their point by tracking and, and interfering with those warships. The danger here is that this is a scenario which can easily lead to a mistake, a blunder. We talked about the danger of a war starting by accident, technical accident, but they can also happen by political miscalculation. And this is a, a classic example of how you can have a political miscalculation. We have a, our warships steaming or our airplanes flying in the South China Sea to make a point. We have patrol aircraft flying off the coast of China to make a point. The Chinese want to make their point too, and their point is they send airplanes and ships out to harass and buzz our ships and our warplanes. So it's all too easy to imagine that an over overzealous ship pilot or an over a ship captain or an overzealous airplane pilot will overreach his ability and cause an accident. We had some years ago, we had such an accident uh, off <clears throat> where the 
a Chinese fighter plane buzzed an American reconnaissance plane, got too close, and both airplanes crashed. The Chinese pilot died. Our airplane was able to land safely on Tainan Island, a Chinese island. There's a huge, huge political uproar over that. Uh, our ambassador, I remember at the time, barricaded himself in his, feared for his life and barricaded himself in his embassy because the hostility, the fear-mongering which the Chinese government used with their own people got the people whipped up into quite a frenzy. So that is a kind of a situation where a military conflict could get started, not by the decision of the president of China, the president of the United States, but by an inadvertent accident caused by one of our pilots or, or one of their pilots or one of our ship captains, one of their ship captains. And it just escalates up. The bad feelings and hostility that occurred after that Tainan incident were such that we could very well have blundered ourselves in some kind of an escalation process. Fortunately, cooler heads prevailed that time and, and, and it did not get out of control. But that's the kind of situation I worry about. China. Not that China, as president of the United States president, will deliberately start some kind of a military conflict, but that we will blunder into it. Uh, just as I mentioned before, the possibility of blundering into a nuclear war. But the blundering, the, uh, the obvious place for the blunder to occur would be the South China Sea. Just another dimension rose to the China issue is, is unfortunately the Trump administration right now is using China's nuclear arsenal as an excuse not to extend the New START Treaty with Russia. Right. And this is really unfortunate because you know, China poses a nuclear threat to be sure, but their arsenal uh, is orders of magnitude smaller than the US and Russian arsenals. So we, we shouldn't be trying to make China into the next adversary uh, when they're not. And in fact, if you look at what China is doing, they have a very small deterrent, uh, a few hundred nuclear weapons, most of which can't reach the United States. They have a no first use policy that is quite credible because their warheads are not mated to their delivery systems. Uh, and we should not be doing things that force China to act more like us. Frankly, we should be acting more like China and that would calm the situation down. Very good. I'm glad you brought that up, Tom, because I have had a question about the status of the uh, nuclear disarmament talks now. And you actually propose in your book, one of your recommendations is that renewed nuclear reduction talks with Russia could start with President Obama's proposal for an up to one third further reduction in operationally deployed warheads below the new start level, which is 1,550. I agree that that's the easiest and fastest way to get a new reduction to about 1,000 warheads, but you're quite right. Uh, in fact, the current administration wants China to come to the table and says that they are in fact building up new nuclear forces and Russia is building up new nuclear forces, building more nuclear warheads. And for some, this is an excuse uh, not to do any further reductions. Uh, nor to eliminate any further nuclear weapons. Instead, the argument goes, we should be building up weapons and building up new nuclear warheads. I'd be interested in, in what you both have to say about that. Bill, do you want to start on that? I think what's interesting here, Rose, is that during the last year of President Obama's administration, having the despaired of getting a new uh, follow-on to the New START Treaty because of the political opposition he got to the, getting the treaty ratified that you so skillfully negotiated. Uh, but he, he proposed making a unilateral reduction from 1,550 deployed ICBMs with uh, nuclear warheads to 1,000 nuclear warheads. Just do it unilaterally. He said, it's, it's in our security interest. Maybe the Russians will follow. That would be fine. Maybe they don't. That's still fine because we, it's in our security to go from 1,500 to 1,000. That created such a political firestorm that he finally had to back down. And I make that point just to illustrate how deeply embedded in the, in the political conscience it is that we must have parity with the Russians on nuclear weapons and that we ought to have a lot of nuclear, the more the better. And that's why we have written this book. That's why, as recently, I released a podcast called At the Brink. Um, to try to educate the public on this, because if we can educate the public, maybe we can bring the, the Congress around on these issues. The podcast, by the way, is directed primarily at 
the reason we made a podcast is it's really the same ideas, the same thoughts are in the book, but we're trying to get to a younger audience. And so I had my granddaughter, who's only 30, 31, 32, uh, do the podcast and narrate it. And so we are trying to appeal to younger people on that. So any of you would like to get an easier version, an easy way of getting acquainted with these facts than reading the book, you can, you can go to our podcast on that, at the brink. Tom? Just to add, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed when people call for steps like everyone building up nuclear weapons and essentially going back to an arms race um, as if we haven't already done this before. I mean, we have. We, we had an arms race. Uh, we built tens of thousands of nuclear weapons on both sides. We went to the brink of nuclear war and destruction. Uh, and it made us less safe. And and only, you know, by uh, a lot of luck and a little good planning did we get out of nuclear war and end the last arms race. So if anyone is looking at history and then decides that, yeah, we should do that again, I simply don't understand. Anyone who actually lived through the Cold War and the, and the nuclear arms race and thinks that was a good idea and, well, why don't we do it again? It just isn't thinking right, I'm afraid. Well, it does soak up a lot of resources, as you both commented, and uh, we need our resources in, in other areas. There's some curiosity among our viewers about, uh, you know, does a presidential aide really walk around with the president all the time, uh, <laughs> even when he's traveling? Uh, does he stay, you know, outside his bedroom at night? Uh, to be honest, I don't know the answer to the second question, but uh, I do know that from my experience, yes, there's always a presidential aide with uh, the president while he's, while he's traveling, but what, what can you say a bit more about these procedures? You say yes. The answer to all those questions is yes. Tom, do you want to elaborate? Sure. I mean, just to say that as we showed in that photo with, with President Trump, there's a military attache uh, following the president with a football, 24-7, uh, 365. They sleep in the White House. They're always supposed to be on the same plane with the president uh, and never very far from the president. And, and, and certain presidents have, have taken, have found this frustrating, quite frankly. Uh, president Bush, uh, in fact, asked if he, at the end of the Cold War, if we had to do this anymore. Uh, why do I have to have this attache follow me around all the time? Uh, and presidents have, uh, have, are supposed to keep something called the biscuit, uh, the codes that identify themselves, uh, uh, on their person at all times. And there have been numerous cases where certain presidents have misplaced that card or sent it to the dry cleaners in the laundry. So yes, this is a, this is a constant presence in the president's life. Um, and certain presidents have asked the question, why do we still do this? So there's no way of forgetting this responsibility for the president of the United States. No, but it's one of the recommendations that we have in the book is it's time to end uh, the football. It's time to retire the football. And, and instead of the president in a crisis worrying about getting to the football and, and deciding what to do, uh, the president should use that time and get to a safe location. And from a safe location, then spend the time that's required to think about how to respond. And particularly, is it a real attack? Is it a false attack? And based on that, what's the next best step? But the last thing you want to do is rush into a decision. The football is based on the idea that we need to make a quick launch. That's a bad idea. We do not need to make a quick launch. And, and the thought that we need to make a quick launch has led to policies which are very dangerous. So we get, need to get away from the mindset that we need a quick launch. What's the hurry about ending civilization? Let's take time to think about it and deliberate it if we're ever going to use our nuclear weapons. Not, not have a contest to see how, whether we can do it in seven minutes or eight minutes or nine minutes. Rose, if I, if I could add, one of the things that I learned in the process of writing the book was the origin of sole authority, which I assumed the president had sole authority because the country wanted the president to make that decision quickly. In fact, it's not true because it was President Truman in 1945 that took that authority uh, to himself. And of course, there was no risk of a Russian attack in 1945. No one else had nuclear weapons other than the United States in 1945. So what Truman was worried about was not a, a sneak attack from Russia. He was worried about generals using more weapons than he wanted to use. Um, and when he saw the destruction of, of uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, 
uh, he was um, so concerned that this would be overused that he said, I don't want the generals to have this authority. I mean, to keep this authority to civilians only, uh, which was fine. The problem is that he had it only be one civilian uh, himself, and he didn't share that authority with Congress. And, I, and we think it's time that, that that policy be changed and that authority be shared. Thank you very much. Uh, you've already mentioned, Tom, the presidential decree that the Russians put out in June, uh, also outlining a nuclear release policy resting solely on presidential authority, the president being Putin in this case. I like the comment of one Russian analyst who said, and I quote, nuke first, phone later, unquote. Well, I have an idea what you would say to the Russians about this, given the conclusions of your book. But what do you think? Is this something that's worth talking about in uh, a negotiating process at a U.S.-Russian negotiating table? I'd be interested if you think it would be productive. Bill, do you want to take a yes. shot at that? Yes, that's a very important question, I think. We have very little dialogue with the Russians today on any subject. But most importantly, we have very little dialogue with them on nuclear dangers. And I think that is a serious, serious problem. We have many disagreements with the Russian. We dislike many things they're doing. But in fact, in the nuclear field, we generally have an, uh, areas of agreement. We do, neither of us want a nuclear war. And neither of us want nuclear terrorism. Neither of us want nuclear proliferation. So we have relatively common goals in that field. And the, so we should be talking together and talking together oriented around how do we avoid a nuclear catastrophe? How do we avoid nuclear danger? How do we avoid a nuclear accidents and so on? Because if Tom and I are right, the real danger of a nuclear uh, catastrophe lies in an accident or a miscalculation, both of those, both of those can be greatly, the, the probability of them can be greatly lowered if we're talking with each other, we understand what each other's thinking. When I was the Secretary of Defense, I spent more time with the Russian Minister of Defense than any other Minister of Defense. We were working together on nuclear issues, actually. We were working together, this is back in 1994, 95, say at the end of the Cold War. We were working together on how to safely dismantle nuclear weapons in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan, in Belarus, and in Russia, and in the United States. And in the course of that four-year period, we actually dismantled 8,000 nuclear weapons, half of them in the former Soviet Union and half of them in the United States. But the important part of that dialogue was that I had an understanding and a confidence of what the Russians were thinking on these issues. And that lack of understanding that we have today is a very dangerous thing. So we need to get dialogue with the Russians going in the nuclear field. Even if we don't talk about any other issue, even if we want to spit in their face on other issues, in the nuclear field, we should be talking with and talking seriously about areas, areas of mutual interest to make our country safer, their country safer, indeed the whole world safer. Just, just to add, I completely agree we should be talking with the Russians. Um, I'm not sure we want to make these things conditional on Russian support, right? I mean, I think the United States would be safer if we uh, remove sole authority, uh, if we announce a, a no first use policy, if we get rid of our ICBMs. We will be safer if we do all those things, uh, regardless of Russia, what Russia does. So yes, it'd be great if Russia came along with us, um, but I don't think we should wait for Russia. Very good. In fact, I would like to ask you both if you have, because in if you ask the current administration, they would say we are talking to Russia. Even in the last couple of days, they've had working group meetings going on uh, in Vienna to talk about space security, to talk about uh, there are strategic security talks going on, apparently, and also some discussions of uh, verification technology and, and monitoring for the next nuclear arms reduction treaty. Um, how, you know, how do you think... Uh, they're doing so far. How do you think they're uh, they're proceeding? Uh, and uh, I'd be interested if you have any any opinions on that, just from what we've been able to read in the press in in recent days. Tom, you want to start with that one? Sure. Again, talking is good. I, I support dialogue and and connections with the United States and Russia. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem these talks will produce anything in particular, because the United States, the Trump administration, 
has this nonsensical position on extending the New START treaty. I mean, that's what has to happen now is extend New START before it expires in February. And the Trump administration is saying they're reluctant to do that unless China is part of that. Uh, to me, that makes no sense, uh, given China's much smaller nuclear arsenal uh, and the need to continue reducing U.S. and Russian arsenals. So again, dialogue is good, uh, but unfortunately, the Trump administration has has put a hold on the on the main thing they need to be reaching agreement on. Any word of uh, comment from you, Bill, on this? I think the likelihood that China would engage in the strategic arms reduction talks is about zero. And I think, I, in my cynical view, I'm, I, I believe that the administration understands that. And this is just a way of, they, they, they don't like New START, they don't like any nuclear treaties, it, it seems. And this is just a way of putting off, uh, rationalizing why they're not going to extend it. I see. Well, we've talked about Russia, we've talked about China, and one of our viewers asks, uh, how do we effectively educate leaders in places like India and Pakistan to the dangers of, of nuclear war? Uh, and are we doing so? Uh, what do you think about that? Well, we have always tried to do so. And uh, certainly in our sector of defense, I worked on that issue with them. And after, and after being sector of defense, I worked with them on track two, uh, or non-official discussions, aimed at making the nuclear weapons safer, aimed at making it less likely that Pakistan and India would in, get involved in nuclear war. <clears throat> I never had much confidence that I was succeeding in that. I don't know if anybody that's done that, that really believes they succeeded. But I do want to point out that India and Pakistan have had three or three and a half wars, depending on how you count them, over the issue of Kashmir. That issue has not been resolved. So there's always a possibility of a fourth war occurring. And if a war occurred, uh, a fighting military conflict, conventional military conflict, one side would lose, probably Pakistan, because they have the weaker forces. And that side is going to be tempted to use their nuclear weapons. If they use them, the other side would respond and a general nuclear exchange would occur. So we say, well, that's a, how does that affect us? That's another part of the world. We feel bad about the, all those Pakistanis and Indians dying, but it's not going to spread. Even if the war did not spread, if each of them used even half of their nuclear arsenals and, and named at each other's city, the resulting firestorms from these hundreds of cities being destroyed would lead to so much atmospheric pollution uh, getting into, uh, into the stratosphere and basically blocking the sun for some period of time. There's a debate over how long and how intense but most of the models that I've seen suggest that we would have something like temperature drops of a few degrees occurring for a few years. That would be catastrophic for the whole world. So beyond the human death, the, the human toll in Indian Pakistan, now a war between Indian Pakistan would affect the whole world. Just to add a, a short word that, I mean, if, if we want India and Pakistan to, to control their arms race and to stand down and to limit their forces, we need to show a good example. Uh, and we haven't really been doing that. In fact, they've been looking at our example to modernize their forces, to diversify their forces. Um, and so we need to show um, a different picture of what responsible nations do. Thank you. I'm getting a number of questions uh, wondering how exactly it will help if uh, Congress comes into the decision-making process. One questioner asks, well, won't this just lead to, to a bunch of bickering when we really need to be making an urgent decision? And so uh, you've gotten that question probably a lot. I'd like to know how you're thinking about it. Yes, well, what it will definitely lead to, whatever else it leads to, it will lead to slowing down the process. And many people use that as an objection to it. For me, that's a good reason. That's a reason enough for doing it. We want to slow down the process. Um, it almost, it's almost, it doesn't matter who, the, who they bring for consultation. They slow it down, think about it, talk about it, bring in experts, bring in Congress people. 
it slows it down so there's some consideration of what's really at stake here. Tom? Yeah, again, the, the, the question um, reflects the, the misperception that we encounter all the time, which is this decision, a launch decision has to be quick. And, and our a, a main finding of the book is that that's just the wrong approach, that if, you, if a president is forced into a quick decision, they're likely to make the wrong decision. And when it comes to a decision about nuclear war, that could be catastrophic. So we want to buy the president more time, not less, um, and therefore taking sole authority away from the president, sharing it with more people, yes, bogs down the process, but that's exactly what we want to do, and we would go even further and just declare a blanket no first use policy. Uh, that is, that the United States could not use nuclear weapons first uh, and only use them in uh, in a det for deterrence and to respond to a nuclear attack uh, by others. Uh, and and we think that would be in a much safer position for us because it would reduce the risk of accidental war. Incidentally, if we go to a no first use po policy. That fortifies the argument we've been making to phase out of ICBMs, because the ICBMs are fu fundamentally first-use weapons. So they're the first ones you'd use, and that's why they're, one of the reasons they're so, they're so dangerous. Sorry, just to add another thing: um, sure. the the Democratic uh, the draft Democratic policy platform uh, recently came out endorsing uh, sole purpose, which is that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons should be to deter their use by others and not to deter chemical or biological or conventional weapons. Uh, this is um, to us a, a very helpful position. It goes beyond what the Obama administration had done previously. Um, and it's what we could assume uh, a President Biden would do if elected. Um, it isn't quite no first use. Um, some make distinctions between those two. Uh, to me, the distinctions are small, but we would hope to see progress on this issue in a Biden administration. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Well, uh, we're going around the world talking uh, about countries with nuclear aspirations. We haven't yet talked about Iran. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, of course, uh, was uh, something that the Obama administration worked on in order to, uh, to dismantle the Iranian uh, nuclear program uh, for developing and, and, uh, and producing fissile material that we all feared would uh, be used for nuclear weapons. It's the JCPOA, as it's called, has been under attack by the current administration, but the other negotiating partners, which include UK, France, Germany, China, and Russia, have been working with Iran to try to continue implementing it. And the International Atomic Energy, Energy Agency in Vienna has also been involved in that effort. So how do you two see the importance of this, uh, of this agreement and, and its future? Bill, do you want to start on that one? <clears throat> we were concerned for very good reason about the possibility of getting Iran getting nuclear weapons. First of all, there was evidence that they were moving in that direction was, I found, quite convincing. And secondly, if they were to get nuclear weapons, if they were to get, even get close to nuclear weapons, the probability of this leading to a disastrous Mideast war, I thought, was very high. Because I could not see Israel allowing that to happen. And the only way they had of stopping it would be if they came down to using military force to stop it, they would. And then that could very well lead to a broader Mideast war and it just doesn't bear thinking about. This could be really catastrophic. So the JCPOA, whatever you can argue against it, accomplished that purpose. It, put, it froze Iran's nuclear, nuclear weapon program. In fact, it caused them to back, to back off on the phases of it. So I think it took away the risk for at least a decade or so of Iran going to nuclear weapons. A huge accomplishment. It did not do other things. It did not solve some of Iran's bad behavior in other fields, for example, in supporting terrorism. I agree that would be nice if we had an agreement to do that, but to throw away the agreement that dealt with the most important danger in Iran, the nuclear danger, because it didn't do these other things, is just uh, not thoughtful, I think. We cause we can't do everything It doesn't mean we should do nothing. In this case, we could do something that's very worthwhile, and we should never not have given it up. 
I would hope if a new administration comes in, the, for one of the early actions they would have would be to reestablish as quickly as possible the JCPOA. Thank you. Tom, uh, here's perhaps a tough one for you. One of our viewers asks, uh, do you have any comments about Israel and nuclear weapons since we're talking about the Middle East? That is always uh, a tough one. I, you know, I'll, I'll just say that if we are going to solve the Middle East uh, nuclear issue, uh, I think we have to look at it more broadly and we have to look at it as a weapons of mass destruction issue. Uh, and there have been proposals for a weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East. I think that makes good sense if you can get it, but it will take tremendously tough negotiations between all of the countries in the Middle East, all the countries that have weapons of mass destruction programs, including Israel, uh, including uh, Iran. Uh, and um, you know, that'll be a tough haul, but, but I think the only way to do it is to, is to look at an equitable uh, region-wide system that increases the security of all. Very good, thank you for that. We've been talking about conventional, uh, sorry, about nuclear weapons this whole uh, period, but a question has come in about uh, conventional arms control and the conventional side of the equation. Of course, uh, conventional arms control has been uh, also under pressure in recent years. The Russians ceased uh, implementing the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty in, in 2007. This year, the uh, current administration says they've been actually violating the Open Skies Treaty, and they have notified withdrawal from the Open Skies Treaty, which is a, a treaty under which uh, the signatories, including a lot of our allies in Europe, can fly over the territory of the Russian Federation. The Russians get to fly over, over uh, the US and also European territory. So it's a confidence building kind of treaty. But uh, I wonder what you two think about uh, this whole realm of, of conventional arms control and, and whether you see any hope for the future. I'd be interested in, in your comments. Bill, you want to start on that one? I, I was a supporter of the CFE treaty, and I'm sorry to see it falling by the wayside. But I, on the other hand, and I do have another hand here, one of my main arguments why the U.S. does not need to depend on its nuclear weapons is because we have such an effect of conventional forces. I do not think we need to build up a conventional force beyond what we have them now. But I would, I would think twice before I agreed to any measures that involved a major cut in our conventional forces. They play a very important role in peacekeeping throughout the world. And they give the basis for not depending on our nuclear weapons. Tom. So this is a this is a tough question because as as Bill just rightly said, you know the U.S. Uh, dominance in conventional weapons allows us to to consider reducing our dependence on nuclear weapons. But you flip that over to the Russian side, and if the Russians perceive an imbalance uh, or a deficit in their conventional forces, it's going to make them all the more depend on their nuclear forces. So in, in order to get the Russians to also reduce their dependency on nuclear weapons. We somehow have to get to some level where both countries are, are feeling sufficiency in their conventional weapons and aren't feeling overly threatened or, or feel that their conventional forces um, are, are insufficient. Uh, so how we reach that balance uh, is, is the trick. Very good. I had one I think a uh, more detailed question about your book, because one of the proposals you make, I think is actually uh, pretty controversial, but uh, it would, I think, be worth thinking about hard. Your book is really focusing on the US-Russian nuclear relationship, which has long been based on what we call first strike stability. And, and Bill, you talked about parity, and that uh, comes from uh, the fact that we have a balance of forces, we can maintain the ability to threaten each other with a first strike. And uh, in fact, uh, this is not the approach that, uh, that others have taken. And in particular, China, they have had a secure second strike approach. It's been the basis for their nuclear doctrine. But now uh, China is shifting capabilities to ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles and SLBMs at a high level of readiness that seem to be moving them more in a first strike direction. Are we in danger of uh, 
kind of uh, attracting them to uh, our approach and uh, and losing out on this more stabilizing uh, approach, as you call it, second use assured retaliation. Yes, yes, we are. I mean, I think that's the reason why, you know, rather than goading China into giving up their no first use policy, we should be matching China's no first use policy. And we should be trying to uh, implement policies that are closer to China's. Uh, reducing offensive forces, having those forces be less threatening by not having them on alert, uh, and um, and doing more of what <laughs> China is doing. I think the the more alarming positions that China or that we may see China moving towards are largely because of the of actions that the United States is taking, uh, particularly in missile defense deployments that we see as defensive, but China sees as offensive. Uh, so I think we need to see the effect of our own policies that are having on China's behavior um, and, and see our own policies in a way to, uh, to make China's stance less threatening to us. Rose, this gives me an opportunity to make a little riff on our ballistic missile defense system. We have built this system on some sort of a theory, I think, that it provides some defense for the United States. China sees it as a challenge to their nuclear deterrence forces. And their solution to that problem is to, would be to build more forces so they could saturate, overwhelm the system by saturation. Every defense system, every ballistic missile defense system is subject to being defeated by saturation. This system that we've designed to build is particularly susceptible to that because it operates in the outer atmosphere where it's very easy to build decoys. So you don't have to saturate the system. You don't have to build a lot of ICBMs, a lot of warheads. You can build a relatively few warheads and then multiply their effectiveness by having 10 times or 100 times as many decoys as you have warheads. And decoys work very well in the outer atmosphere, which is where our missile defense system works. So the irony of it is that we have built, at a considerable expense, a ballistic missile defense system that does not defend us, that will not defend us. But on the other hand, it has inspired other countries thinking maybe it will work to uh, increase the offensive force. So it's actually increased the danger to us by providing incentives to China to build more missiles and more warheads without offering us any defense and compensation of that. Tom, you want to add anything on that side of the equation? Well, well just to say, you know, that, that not only do U.S. missile defense deployments against strategic forces not make us safer, uh, and not only do they cause other countries to build up their forces, as, as Bill mentioned, um, but they make Russia in particular less likely to reduce their forces. You know, when we try to seek arms control and arms reduction agreements with Russia, uh, what they say is, well, we're worried about your missile defenses. So unless you put a limit on your missile defenses, we're not going to reduce our offensive forces. So we, we have a real problem. By, by building up our missile defenses, we've created a floor below which Russia won't go. So mm -hmm. if we want to reduce our forces significantly lower we're going to have to deal with missile offenses somehow. I, was, I should add one qualification to what I said before. When I was taught panning missile defense systems saying they don't work, I was speaking of strategic missile defense system. Uh, I have, have supported for years and continue to support tactical missile defense systems, which have a technically quite different problems, and, and the ones we have are, are quite effective for what they do. Indeed, you're right. And I experienced uh, that at NATO. They're very important for the defense of our allies in, in Europe. And I, I agree with you on their, their technical uh, capacity. We just, we're down to our very last minute. So I want to ask you both uh, a kind of uh, lightning round. If you had an invitation to the White House on January 20th, what would be the uh, three sentences you'd say to the president, uh, whether it's Mr. Trump or his opponent, uh, who was actually sworn in that day? No, you say, want to start? I would say, first of all, our whole nuclear policy is based on the wrong threat, based on assuming the wrong threat. The threat is not 
a surprise attack from Russia, a bolt out of the blue. The, surprise, the threat is a blundering into nuclear war. And secondly, because we've made this wrong decision, our policies have turned out to be wrong. We've based our policies on solving the wrong problem. And not only are those policies wrong and costing us more than they should, but they're actually aggravating, they're actually increasing the danger from an, an act, a blundering into a nuclear war, an accidental nuclear war. Those are the two, two important points I'd make. Tom, why don't you add a few to that? Your turn, uh, Tom, real quick. Sure, I would just tell the president that they have a historic opportunity to rethink national security and to look at the resources that we're spending, particularly at the Pentagon, and how we might redeploy those, those resources to more pressing needs. Very good. Thank you both for a great discussion. Big thanks to Secretary William Perry and Tom Kalina for joining us today. We'd also like to thank our audience for watching and participating live. Excellent questions. Thank you all. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Rose Gottemuller. Thank you and stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Rose. Hi, I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 100 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, mayors, county supervisors, respected medical experts, the president of the University of California, experts on anxiety and happiness in times of stress, and many, many more. Every program includes a live chat. So you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50%. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again. Consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe.